Hello. Um, welcome. Glad to be back as we look at uh, session 11 for the Gospel of John and um, looking at John chapter 6, verses 24 through 71. And okay, so continuing forward, this is a long last uh, part of this chapter, and it's one giant. Um, story. So this section we're going to need to go through pretty quickly, but it's a very, very intriguing uh, chapter, or this part of the chapter. This comes right after um, Jesus has fed the 5,000, and then um, the crowds are so overwhelmed with excitement that um, he fears they're going to take him by force and make him king by force, and he knows that's not what he's um, that they have a misunderstanding of what his role is. So he goes off to pray by himself, sends his disciples across the lake, the Sea of Galilee. And um, meanwhile, the rest of the people wake up the next morning that were there during the feeding of the 5,000, and they say, wait, where did he go? So they take off, and they head back across the lake by, by boat. And uh, Jesus, meanwhile, has caught up with his disciples um, in the during a stormy time he um, catches up with them in the middle of the lake and uh, they continue on to Capernaum uh, where they were heading so as we keep for going forward now we're going to have um, some additional teaching which is just building on top of these experiences that um, um, Jesus's disciples and the crowds have had since they were with him in the previous um, huge miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. So, um, just a quick recap. In the book so far, we understand from the way that John has framed um, all of this his writings, that his purpose is that he is trying to help underscore what Jesus' mission was and that Jesus' own mission was to, because he was God himself and he was with God from the very beginning and the light and the life of men, he came to live as a man among us so that he could help reveal to us and help us know um, the unknown God. And he was going to make the invisible God visible. So what Jesus is doing all throughout his ministry is, in a sense, making the invisible God visible. Revealing in new and deeper ways what it is that uh, God would have us understand about himself. Now, um, we hear this word Messiah and Christ a lot. Messiah is the Hebrew word. Christ is the Greek word. And all that means, it's not a last name, it doesn't mean anything um, about a person's name, but it, it refers to uh, anointed one, which was a way of kind of saying a king. And so the Jewish people were very familiar with the term Messiah, um, and the Greek version of that is Christ, like we said. And they were expecting a earthly king that was kind of going to come and give them deliverance maybe even sent by God, but it was going to give them an earthly deliverance um, and vanquish their enemies and help Israel um, regain some sense of pride in who they are and who they were as a people. But as Jesus goes throughout his ministry, he says, yes, I am the promised king, but not in the way that you think I am. And so he continues to um, expand their understandings with his outside-the-box revelations that he uses through doing various signs and teachings that as he begins to unpack what it means, they get that he's, some of them, get that he's the Messiah, but um, he helps explain that in a new way. The fact that even the crowds got that he was the Messiah, that he was their expected king, um, is exactly the reason why Jesus took off after the um, um, feeding of the 5,000s because he knew they don't understand it yet. And they would 
go ahead and make me king by force rather than truly understand what my kingdom is going to be about. So here we go. I'm going to jump into this. We're going to move quite quickly and we may move through these and then come back and unpack some of the, the text uh, as it is. Again, as we look here on the screen, um, they started over here on this side, went over to this area, which is where they had the feeding of the 5,000. Then the disciples head back this way. There were some other people. Oh, Jesus goes up into the, the wilderness here and is praying. Uh, other people have heard about the the goings on and they head over to this direction to try to find Jesus. When everybody wakes up the next morning, they're like, going, wait, where are they? And they said, well, we didn't see Jesus get in the boat when the disciples left. So they said, well, maybe they all went over to Capernaum. And so they go this way and everybody is now re regathering in uh, Capernaum. So, when they find him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him the God the Father has placed his seal of approval. When they asked him, "What must what must we do to do the what must we do to do the work that God requires?" Jesus answered, "The work of God is this: to believe in the one He has sent." So they asked him, "What sign then will you give us that we may see it and believe you? What will you do?" Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, "He gave them bread from heaven to eat." Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it's not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it's my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, this is the key point here, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you've seen me and you still don't believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. For this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. At this the Jews there began to grumble. Excuse me. At this the Jews there began to grumble about Him because they said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can He now say, I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling amongst yourself, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the man in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forevermore. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply amongst themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. 
Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forevermore. I'm going to stop right there uh, and just do, take this first section. So there's a couple of things that is very important for us to understand, that are very important for us to understand about so many of Jesus's analogies and so many of the ways that he tries to um, explain the authority by which he does things. And that is, here's the pattern. You don't, you're, you're seeking God. God wants a relationship with you. You're, you're seeking God, but you don't know how to have a relationship with him on your own. You try and it doesn't quite work out. Partly it's because you don't completely understand who God really is, which is natural because he's the creator of the universe and we're people and we're very limited and how we can understand things. But when Jesus, the way that John describes it, Jesus comes down as God and says, I'm going to reveal myself to you in a new way. And when I come down and I experience life together with you, I'm going to continue to point to God. And when you look at me, you're going to be able to see God in a new way because you haven't been able to completely grasp it yet. So that's why he's constantly uh, blowing their minds. He's, he's um, with he's forcing them to go outside the box in order to understand what it means to be, uh, what, what it really means to worship God, but also what it really means to have a relationship with God. This is no exception. This passage right here is no exception because he uses a whole lot of um, images related to the Passover time, um, which is when um, we... The, the Jewish people um, celebrated uh, their deliverance from Egypt right before they went out into the wilderness. Um, now, we haven't, at this point in time, as this story is going on in the book of John, um, they haven't had the Last Supper yet. They haven't had that first communion together with the disciples. So when Jesus is making all these comments about my 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 flesh, my blood, um, and he's talking about being the bread, it's it's understandably just going right over the heads of of the people that are listening. It is not unreasonable for any of the people there to not completely grasp what Jesus is saying. If we were there, if you were there, you would be like, what in the heck is going on? Now, what he's doing here in this section is that he's drawing uh, um, an example from the feeding of the 5,000 and how they, had, they didn't have enough bread to go around, yet Jesus provided a miracle and took care of everyone um, through that miracle. And he's tying that back to, this is the same thing that happened to your ancestors in the desert. They didn't have enough to eat in the desert when Moses was leading them towards the promised land. So I am trying to lead you towards this new thing, this new deeper understanding of God and his relationship with you. And he says, and the reason you guys are all still hanging around is because you, you, you're really more focused about the bread then you are focused on the new reality of where we're going, the way that the Israelites um, knew that they were going to a new promised place, but they were just whining because they were still hungry. And he's saying, we need to get these two things in perspective. Um, now, um, as he continues to go on, um, he, you know, he draws upon that image of, uh, Moses, through God, provided the manna in the desert, and you were, and and your ancestors were totally taken care of. And then Jesus does this this twist, and he and he says, "But yet the thing that you're really looking for is mm -hmm. found in me. But it's not just me get uh, performing a miracle and giving you all the physical bread you need. But I am 
the bread. I am the sustenance. I am that thing that is going to help you go to the new promise, the new relationship that you've always longed for, the new deliverance from the bondage that you're in right now. Just like the Israelites were slaves in Egypt and Moses helped deliver them through, God delivered them through Moses and provided for them along the way to this promised land that he intended for them. Jesus is helping to bring these people that are around there back into this relationship with God. They just don't fully grasp everything. So part of what we continue to see, and this is where I started with a few minutes ago, part of what we continue to see in the way that John, the disciple, the gospel writer, explains and Jesus uses these examples all the time is as I am God, I come down and represent God to you. But my authority is not just look at what I'm doing and let's hope that um, that's something that God really wants. But he's saying, no, I am God and I'm bringing this down to you. And everything that I do, I can only do because I've been given the authority from God. I couldn't do these things if it weren't for the authority of God. I couldn't say these things if it weren't that God had given me the power to do it. There's no explanation for the miracles I can do apart from me being sent by God, me being empowered by God, me having the authority to do this from God. I am doing this because it's reflective of what God is, what his character is, what his essence is, and it's what his desire is. So when you're looking at me, Jesus is always saying, when you're looking at me, now you're experiencing the kind of God that you've always been striving for but have never completely understood. So we can call that, if we're, if we're just thinking about the English language, um, uh, really everything that Jesus is doing is derivative. I'm, I'm using that word derivative. It sometimes has a, a negative con connotation, especially when we're thinking about, I'm not talking about the math term, but I'm thinking about the, the um, it's used in finances. It's also used in um, just in this most common English sense of uh, this thing right here is based on this other thing. So this is a subset of this thing, and it is not merely reflective. It doesn't really uh, point to the, the more basic thing, which is up here. It, this derivative doesn't exist if it weren't for the thing up here. So if you're looking at financial instruments and it's a, it's a whatever kind of derivative, you'll see that word. It's, it, it's meaning that this particular type of investment is based upon this. So whatever Jesus is doing, he cannot do if it were not based upon God and God's power and God's character and God's essence. So everything that Jesus is doing, he can only do because it's derivative of who God is and what God does. This is not original thinking. That's why the word derivative sometimes has a negative connotation when we're thinking about movies or art or novels. You know, you've been reading, you, you've read something and you kind of realize, you know what, that's kind of, that story just feels so much more like this other story. Or um, that piece of art is derivative of this other thing. And there it's meant in a negative sense in that that artist didn't come up with that on their own. They kind of copied and cheated and stole from uh, a previous artist. Now some people, some music is derivative of these other sources, and it's not done as a ripoff. It's not like they're um, uh, trying to steal someone else's music, but they're they're trying to pay tribute to it. Um, but in particular, as we're looking at the way that I'm using that word, that 
Jesus is not ripping off God, but because he is God, everything that you're seeing is coming straight from God's authority and God's power. And it's just important to kind of go back and think through everything that you know about Jesus, everything that you've read, and just recognize Jesus claims for himself, I don't do this on my authority. And it's not some weird, it's not some weird pride thing or weird humility thing um, that he's saying, oh no, it's not really that big of a deal. All he's saying is, no, I couldn't do this if it weren't for God. You want to know what God is? Look at me. I am showing you what God is. I don't exist apart from God. And that's the kind of language that you continue to see all throughout this book. And as we go forward in some of the, the next chapters, you're going to see the exact same thing. Drill down, drill down even deeper. Now, his language here is very weird. I mean... This would freak me out. Uh, he's obviously provoking these crowds. And, and think about it. I mean, this has been thousands of people that have been with him, hearing his teaching across the lake, that so many of them have followed him back across the lake. That's quite a, that's quite a journey to just keep on uh, figuring out what's up with this Jesus guy. And Jesus says, you want to know what's up with this Jesus guy? Uh, don't just come for the physical food, come for the spiritual food, the new reality that I'm bringing. So here we go. He's continuing to teach and boom, they hear him talk about this, eat my flesh, drink my blood. And he's like, the disciples are saying on hearing it, many of his disciples said, uh, this is hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his, his disciples were grumbling about this. And he's not, just, he's not just talking about the disciples, his 12 apostles that he's chosen, but he's talking about this greater group of people that have been following him around with supposed interest in uh, being his follower. Some that say, yeah, we got it. He's the king. We want to make him king. But aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? Then if you see the Son of Man to ascend then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I've spoken to you, they are full of spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. So you see the same image. He's like, I've come down to help reveal this to you. You can't even handle the most basic stuff that I'm telling you about. So if this offends you, when what are you going to do when you see me go back to where I really am? Where I really came from? what my true origin is. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, that is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Isn't that amazing? Just partway through the book, um, the book, biggest crowd that Jesus has had with over 5,000 people. Jesus keeps on teaching and they're like, I'm good. That's too weird. And many of his disciples left. So then Jesus turns to his 12 apostles that he's chosen. So what about you? You don't want to leave too, do you? Jesus asks the 12. And this is such an interesting response that Simon, that Peter says. Lord, where do we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. So Simon, on behalf of the others, is, is speaking out of, a, of a, a kind of a spiritual um, insight where he's able to say, I don't, we don't have any place else to go. We don't get this, but we know that something is different. You are the one who's been promised that we've been waiting for, but while we don't grasp it, while we don't totally get it, where else do we go? We're going to go ahead and go all in with you. 
whatever that's going to mean, we're all in. Now, they continue to struggle with what that means to be all in, as Jesus will continue to unpack what it means for him to be the Messiah, him to be the representative of God, showing them how to relate to him. But this is a remarkable statement. If you could just imagine what it's like for all these crowds and the 12 who've been so excited earlier, they were very excited about him being the king, um, although they didn't quite fully understand. They watched the crowds totally understand how much, uh, how excited the, the crowds were about him becoming king. And then I'm sure that they're thinking, ah, oh, this is what we've been waiting for. And then all of a sudden, Jesus, you just turned everybody off. And wait a minute, everybody's leaving. And so he, in a sense, he's, he's re revisiting this call. Okay, is he, are you still in? Are you still in? Is this what you want? And they're like, where else do we go? We know that you are what we're waiting for. We don't quite know what that means. So Jesus replies, have I not chosen you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. And then here's John, the writer's commentary. And he says, well, just in case you didn't know, he meant Judas. The son of Simon Iscariot, who, though one of the twelve, was later to betray him. Um, the remarkable thing that we can take away from all of this today is just that um, it's clear that Jesus isn't just about drawing the crowds, but he does have compassion on the crowds. He wants to take care of physical needs, but he's wanting to get his followers to connect with God in a way that takes them through the desert. I mean, it's no coincidence that this deserted place where they had the feeding of the 5,000 is where there's no other, there, there's no shops around there. There's no place where they can go and get food. And so when he, he performs this miracle out in the middle of nowhere, it is a, a kind of reimagining of what happened with the Israelites leaving Egypt. They were miserable in Egypt, but they were taken care of. And so when they go out into the to the desert, many of them were like, man, I'm, I'm done. I don't, I'm ready to go back. It's better to be a slave in Egypt. And they, they lost their hope, all kinds of, throughout all the troubles, but yet God still took care of them along the way. And part of that journey that they had over those years where they were traveling, meandering through the desert, trying to get to the promised land, was part of what was eventually helping shape them so that they could become everything that um, God had intended for them when he was bringing them out of Egypt into the promised land. And that's part of Jesus' plan right here. He goes, I'm not here just for the crowds. My 12 disciples, I want you to keep following me. And um, it may get worse before it gets better, but it's going to be so worth it. And so pointing forward, this is where we're going.